so we're going to start off the monitoring and troubleshooting track. Uh, and the first speaker that we've lined up is Simon. Uh, he is uh, from Acquia, and he's going to talk about uh, how to find needle in a haystack problem um, using anomaly detection in Sumo. And he's a very experienced user uh, of Sumo, so I'm pretty sure uh, you'd learn a lot of new stuff uh, from him here. Uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, if you're planning to... Uh, uh, sorry. I'll come to you later. Um, so if you're planning to uh, do any of the other sessions here in the breakout area, then you can take your receivers. But if you're uh, going out of the room, out of this breakout hall, then we would request you to uh, uh, replace the, the speaker, uh, the receiver, um, towards the end of the session and not take it with you when you're uh, exiting the sessions. Right? So with that, I will hand it over to Simon. He will talk about his presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can you all hear me okay from the mic? Great. Uh, thanks for uh, attending this presentation. So, uh, my name is Simon Shutter. I work with a company called Acquia. I'm a technical account manager at Acquia. Uh, and as a TAM, I work with a small portfolio of enterprise customers. I provide them strategic advice. Um, work them closely on their web applications, which they host with us. I also have uh, experience with Sumo. I've been using it for about four years. And I just um, took well, one of the certification courses this morning as well. Um, so a little bit about, whoops. So this is my talk, <laughs> finding the needle in the haystack. Um, <clears throat> so work that we've been doing over the last few months, looking um, to minimize the impact of platform releases on our platform. Sorry. So yeah, a little bit about Acquia. Uh, so we provide a digital experience platform with a Drupal content management system at its core. So everybody, every customer that um, hosts with us is basically using Drupal plus one or more other products that we uh, uh, offer. So we have about uh, 4,000 customers around the world running a total of 7,000 web applications. We manage uh, 20,000 AWS instances in 30 data centers around the world. And we use Sumo for a variety of things, but we send around uh, one and a half terabytes of data, log data to uh, Sumo every day. So what do we do with all this data? Well, we support individual customers. We help them with performance issues. Uh, they're running their own applications, remember. Uh, we help them um, identify and mitigate DDoS instances, uh, incidents, rather. Uh, we help them with application errors. And um, for several customers, we'll provide monthly reports, and we'll use the Sumo API to uh, uh, collate that information. So we also conduct platform-wide uh, log analyses to identify security risks, infrastructure issues, and long-term trends. <clears throat> Finally, uh, as I said at the beginning, we monitor platform code releases, and that, that topic forms the basis of my talk today. So as our platform lifecycle has evolved, we've moved from the monolithic software releases to high-frequency continuous deployments of subcomponents. Um, and the downside of that is that every platform change represents a potential risk that customers will be impacted. And even with rigorous testing, there's always the possibility that one or more customers could be impacted once we push our platform change to the live environment. So that's where the title of my presentation originates. How do we find a needle of small, which could be a very small number of impacted customers in a haystack that comprises thousands of applications. <clears throat> so let's look at the big picture first. So this chart uh, shows the total Apache errors per day for the last eight months across our entire platform. The axis labels aren't really important uh, as we'll be looking at the relative differences between the charts. So you can see there are a number of prominent spikes 
and you might think that these represent situations where a common issue is impacting all of our customers. In fact, if you break down this chart by AWS region and the type of customer which we categorize uh, with a, the word realm, uh, you'll see that the issues are not uniform. They impact different areas at different times. <clears throat> and finally, if we uh, break down the chart further by individual customers, you can see that many of these spikes are attributed to single customers. So these single customers represent a lot of noise when we're trying to determine if there are platform issues or issues that we've caused uh, that are causing large numbers of errors. Um, <clears throat> how many of you are familiar with the transpose operator? So you'll know that uh, when you're transposing data, there's a limitation on the number of dynamic fields that Sumo will let you create. So when we have 4,000 customers, that's a lot more than 300 fields if we're trying to transpose and present a time series of customers. So what we do, and this is a fairly common technique, is to um, re-aggregate the data, re-aggregate it once, and then we'll uh, look at the customers which have a lower than a certain threshold number of errors, apply them into a bucket called other, re-aggregate the data. And so this purple, these purple lines represent that long tail of low traffic or low, tra low error customers that are lumped into a single category, which then enables us to present all the data in one chart with confidence. So let's learn, spend a couple of minutes looking at the anatomy of a platform release. So a platform release for Acquia may require no manual intervention. It may require uh, that web services are restarted or it may even require a reboot. It depends what we're doing. Uh, but depending on the amount of manual intervention, it can take hours or days to release an update to several thousand hosts. So this chart represents a single platform release that occurred earlier this year, and the time range is about 12 hours. Um, each column is the number of hosts that were updated in a two-minute period. Again, these are just, I'm going to show you relative charts, so you don't need to know the absolute numbers. So in this uh, chart, I've broken down the data by the realm or the type of customer. And this is important because each realm is slightly different from a platform perspective, and it's important that we monitor them separately for anomalies. Here I further divided the releases by realm and geographic region. So that is uh, AWS region. And then finally, I've broken down by realm, region, and AZ, availability zone. Now monitoring the platform by AWS zone is important for several reasons. First, our customers are provisioned with hosts in different AZs to uh, provide high availability and failover. In the event that a data center in one zone experiences issues, like that would ever happen. Um, so from a release perspective, this architecture is significant as we release code by zone to minimize service interruptions. So we'll, for a particular customer, we may send a, a platform update to five hosts, and then half an hour later, another five hosts, the other five hosts that they have with us. So this makes anomaly detection a challenge if half the hosts are exhibiting an issue and the others are running fine. The other point I wanted to make is that uh, you'll see that some of these colors, some of the uh, columns are really quite short. So we do have some customer types and some availability zones where the numbers are quite low. So when you're doing anomaly detection, you need to be able to uh, write queries or processes that will capture and identify those anomalies at different scales. So before I get into the anomaly detection, I just wanted to clarify that I'm going to be talking about detecting anomalies where we understand the data and we have a good idea of what we're looking for. 
in these examples, I'll basically be looking at Apache errors. Um, so I'm not talking about machine learning using log reduce, log compare, or other techniques. It's just plain old boring anomalies. <clears throat> so how many of you have used the outlier operator? Okay. So the outlier is uh, an interesting uh, it's an interesting feature that Sumo provides. Um, <clears throat> we originally steered away from it, um, and then I was doing research, and potentially what the outlier not operator does um, is uh, it, it essentially what I was trying to do anyway manually with uh, various uh, query, <clears throat> more complex queries. So. What the outlier does is it calculates the deviation of a data point from historic data. So it helps you identify when you've got a, an anomaly, basically. In statistical terms, it calculates the standard score. And the output, from a visualization perspective in Sumo, is a line chart with markers wherever a data point exceeds the threshold number of standard deviations from the mean. So we'll look at examples in the upcoming slides. <clears throat> so, this is essentially Z represent, in this equation, Z represents the uh, um, <coughs> standard score, X is the data point, you've got the mean on the right, and underneath is the standard deviation. <clears throat> so, the operator has a number of options, including the uh, uh, adjusting the threshold, <coughs> um, how many consecutive data points above a threshold are considered a violation or anomaly, and the direction, which lets you define whether you're interested in upward trends, downward trends, or both. So if you combine query scheduling and alerting capabilities of Sumo with the outlier operator, you have a very powerful monitoring tool. However, unless you've got very homogeneous data, you'll have to do extra work to ensure that the signal-to-noise ratio is high. This will minimize alert fatigue and from false positives and ensure that customer impacting events don't slip through the cracks. So, look at it, some examples. This is a very simple query where we're aggregating the total number of errors for a one particular availability zone for one particular realm. And you can see that there are many prominent spikes, <coughs> but the outlier command operator has identified with these pink triangles um, a number of uh, uh, anomalies which is probably a, lo a lot of represents a lot of false positives if you're alerting on that and in our in our case because we have customers of various sizes the number of errors that are generated <clears throat> vary considerably but what we're really after is how many customers are impacted by a platform release not the uh, absolute number of errors. So what we do is we um, run the aggregation again. And the second time round, we're basically ending up with a count of the number of customers with errors. And again, this is very, a very basic query, counting the number of customers with errors. But you can see that the number of anomalies or false positives has been reduced. <coughs> and um, Then we, you can do some adjustments. We can look at the threshold, so how many standard deviations, how uh, bad an incident needs to be to um, trigger an alert and a threshold uh, exceedance. So in this example, I've just changed the threshold from three to four just to show you the uh, impact of doing that. The other thing you can do is to uh, force the number of consecutive exceedances of thresholds to be your trigger for an anomaly. So if you have some ephemeral event, you're, let's say you're just restarting Apache, you're bound to have a, a couple of 500s as you go, but it'll quickly clean up. So the idea of having consecutive, <coughs> having this consecutive uh, option is to basically uh, do away or hide those uh, ephemeral short-lived issues. 
So the other thing that we wanted to do to reduce noise is that we have some customers who even in production have a really low level of uh, traffic coming to their site for all sorts of reasons. They may have a CDN that offloads most of the traffic. They may just be a small, very small customer. It, they may just be in a soft release. It, it doesn't matter. But the point is that those low numbers impact our analysis because you may have missing data when you're doing the outlier calculations and that throws things off. So what we do is we have a scheduled query that identifies the sites that are, have true decent traffic amounts that we can actually feel confident we can um, analyze. And we then, in our query for looking for the uh, um, outliers, we look up those sites. And if they're not on that list, we just discard them from the analysis. So this uh, chart shows the result of doing that. And you can see we've maybe lost a couple of anomalies, but we've also got rid of a lot of those uh, false positives. In this example, and these are all excerpts basically from one larger query, I'm, I tried to distill it down into the simplest components that I could, but basically we're looking at the relative uh, Apache status codes from comparing 500s to 200s because, as I said, some sites have a lot of traffic, they may have thousands of errors, but it represents just a small fraction of their total volume. So we're looking at relative errors here. So uh, this uh, then has led to uh, even tighter definition of, of these three anomalies. Now, I haven't actually told you what these three anomalies represent, um, but let's just move on to uh, the last one, which was um, that because we have a marker in our syslog of when a release was sent to the host, we know when the release was. And so we have made an attempt to um, do a lookup from a, a separate tab lookup table of release times for each host, and then factor that into the equation. So if, a if an error occurs within 10 minutes of a release, we give it a higher score. In other words, we're boosting the signal that's tied to a release. So, um, that actually um, is the essence of my talk. Um, but I'll just add a couple of final comments um, that are illustrated by this quote from Richard Feynman. So the more testing you do, the better your alerting strategy will be. We use Sumo scheduled views to pre-aggregate data for analysis. This helps us um, do a number of things, but it helped us retroactively look at data over the last eight months. Uh, you know, bearing in mind that we ingest one and a half terabytes per day, a scheduled view allows us to uh, do that historic analysis and run fast queries and do a lot of different types of uh, testing. And we are also using the search job API to conduct uh, automated sensitivity analyses. Oh, I didn't even have my picture of Richard Feynman. Um, so to summarize, Sumo offers a lot of great features to help you identify anomalies. The time you spend to understand your data, your business processes, architecture, and customer behavior will pay dividends. And the more that you can boost the signal to noise ratio, the more confidence you will have in the results. And that's that. I'm happy to answer any questions. We have time. Yes, we have time. Thanks, Simon, for, for giving that uh, uh, description about how to use uh, Sumo for anomaly detections. So are there any questions? At this point? I'll come on my way. Okay. Hello. Uh, I have one question around uh, abnormalities which happen with some frequency, let's say. So probably you notice that uh, maybe your log sources look like this. So for example, when your users are coming to the office, there is a spike for logon attempts, for example, right? And it happens every single day of the week, day of the week right? Right. And how you handle those things? Because there will be always 
uh, alertin in outlier. You cannot you remove it from outlier. Just right. So it, that a lot depends on scale. So if you've got uh, daily uh, trends, uh, then and, and and again it depends on our customer because our customers are global, and um, they all they all see trends at different times and different types of trends. But what we're looking at um, is really anomalies that have occurred in the last hour. We're looking at so. I appreciate that there can be sharp spikes sometimes, but we don't see sharp, very sharp spikes like that. We see a gradual increase. Where there could be a sharp spike would be if there was um, uh, a DDoS attack, there was um, a press release by a company that drew a lot of traffic to the site, but usually even then it's not that sharp. And again, we're looking at errors. We're not looking at, uh, you know, our Normally, we'd, we'd, they'd hope that our, we'd hope that the architecture would withstand that sort of a, a daily trend. I mean, you, we build the, we uh, size the applications and the hardware to uh, be able to absorb that type of trend. Um, but what you, you've raised as an interesting point is that we also filter out sites that have perpetual errors. <laughs> and believe it or not, some customers have a lot of errors, and um, so we factor those out of the analysis because we want to know when our errors are arising, not the ones that are happening all the time. Okay. Uh, anybody else has any questions? I guess not. Okay. Th thank you, Simon. For thank you.